What's up, world, and welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like here at The Real News Network. I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore. Today, July 16th, marks the 153rd birthday of the legendary Ida B. Wells. To honor her and the political lineage she represents, we spoke briefly with one of her more prominent biographers, Dr. Paula Giddings. Giddings is a book editor, journalist, and professor of Africana Studies and author of several books, including a brilliantly written history of Ida B. Wells, Ida, A Sword Among Lions. She joined us from her office at Smith College. This is what it looked like. Okay, Professor Giddings, again, thank you for joining us. If, if we could, let's just have start a conversation with you telling us about Ida B. Wells. Who was Ida B. Wells, and maybe what would you what would you like us to know about Ida B. Wells versus what is known of her? Well, there's 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 so much to know about her, but she is a uh, uh, born in uh, Holly Springs, uh, Mississippi, and uh, evolves really into I think one of the most important leaders uh, that we've uh, had. Uh, she uh, uh, becomes known as an anti-lynching activist, but she also has, does other things as well. Once she gets to Chicago, she starts a settlement house. She's a co-founder of the uh, NAACP. Uh, she creates some of the first women's suffrage organizations uh, uh, in Chicago that are just instrumental and getting people elected, like uh, for example, for example, Oscar uh, de, de Priest uh, and others. So she's quite a she's quite a figure. What one of the things I most admire about her is that I, I think we can give her credit uh, for uh, being the leader of uh, maybe the the beginning of the modern civil rights movement uh, and uh, with her anti lynching campaign. And, uh, Can we start there for a second? Sure. It, 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 there, there's at least two parts of that that I'd like you to touch on. Okay. What was it that she actually uncovered in this anti-lynching campaign? Some of the myths that she uncovered um, and helped expose in terms of the actual underpinnings or the reasons uh, for for these these lynchings, and then. In terms of what you just said about her being a leader of the modern civil rights movement, if you could also take us back and recount for us uh, uh, her uh, pre-Rosa Parks actions. Uh, 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 so Ida B. Wells comes of age in the Reconstruction period. And this is the period when lynchings become uh, begin to really become to be racialized, and more and more uh, blacks, men and women, uh, are being lynched. Lynching is a part of the DNA of the USA. It really starts in the Revolutionary War period. Uh, but after the Civil War, it really becomes uh, racialized. And the reason why so many lynchings went sort of with impunity, unpunished, is because it was charged uh, that black men were running rampant, they are free now, and running rampant and raping uh, white women. And nothing, you know, made, made a con Confederate blood boil more than this. And so these charges ended up with uh, people used at, at, the end of a, at the end of a rope or uh, killed in a mob fashion. And a lot of people didn't know, even blacks didn't know quite what to make uh, of these charges. They were, they were new. What, al what also was going on was a lot of black people that no one had seen before were coming in from the countryside to the cities because of uh, what was happening uh, economically. And many leaders were just sort of wondered what was uh, happening. What Ida Wells did, and this is another significant thing about her, Jared, is that she becomes an investigative reporter. She's already a journalist. Uh, she has a newspaper. She co-owns a newspaper in Memphis, Tennessee. And she begins to, after, particularly after a friend of hers, a close friend of hers was lynched in 1892 in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, who she knew to be an extraordinary man, an extraordinary uh, citizen and who certainly wasn't guilty of any crime, uh, she begins, she, she knows that, that, they, that these charges are wrong about him, and she begins to wonder about other lynchings as well. So she actually goes on the road, and she documents and talks to witnesses and reads newspaper articles and uses something that's very new in this period, something called statistics, in which she begins to, with the new social sciences emerging. And so what, so she begins to document 
that these lynchings are not taking place because of, of rape. They're really taking place to keep black people down. Property is often taken uh, after this. Uh, 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 and uh, she also says, well, you know, what's really going on now, there, there are some uh, liaisons going on between black men and white women, but they're voluntary. Which makes the Confederacy even more angry, I would think, than rape, right? I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, in, the, in that illogic, right? Let's really get somebody <laughs> crazy now. Right. Uh, uh, and so she goes on. Uh, so she goes on that campaign. But of course, at the tip of the spear uh, is our stereotypes about black men and uh, black women, of stereotypes around race uh, and violence. And she also understands, and she's really one of the first to understand, because uh, the press uh, it, uh, changes in this period of time, where they begin to actually criminalize people, where they take citizens who are good citizens and begin to make, uh, uh, characterize them as, 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 as criminals. So she understands that there's something else going on here. There's a criminalization going on. There are false charges going on. She understands that you have to deal with this rape issue, which a lot of people didn't want to deal with, in order to, to, um, to, uh, to, to unwind a lot of those stereotypes, including against black women who, uh, of course, are seen in this period as uh, perceived as, as promiscuous. Uh, one of the reasons black men are supposed, uh, supposedly raping uh, uh, white women, because white women are kind of innocent and they have an allure, whereas black women are, are, are promiscuous uh, and, and, and difficult to be satisfied and, and all that. So, but in reality, it was, it was as you mentioned, it was, uh consensual liaisons, and, yep. and then primarily the, the lynchings were also meant to blunt economic organization and activity of the black community. That was, if I understood you correctly, if I remember the history in your book correctly, that was the primary, uh, even, even more so than the, 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 the sexual encounters, the primary reason for, for the lynchings and the violence itself, the terrorism itself. A absolutely. What she was saying in so many words, no good deed is going unpunished. Uh, with black people. And this is important uh, because of the, she breaks through the ideas of the day that if someone has been lynched, they must have done something wrong. Maybe they're not doing what someone says they are, but they must be criminals. The, you know, Booker T. Washington used to say, uh, no graduate of Tuskegee ever got lynched. Right. You know, that used to drive her crazy. Um, so she's really unwinding so much uh, uh, around this. And so she is saying that, you know, uh, this, uh, this, all this idea of good behavior, of uh, uplift, it, it has limitations. It's not going to save you. It's not going to save you from the exploitation and the violence uh, of the South. So we might also forget, worry, not worry about that so much, and mobilize and take our destiny in our own hands, which she does. So if I can, just to, just to put a bow on it, black oppression is not the response to black behavior. It is, <laughs> in other words, it, exactly. black, the oppression of black people is not, uh, does not generate, is not generated by uh, the behavior of black communities themselves. In it, fact, sometimes just the opposite. Exactly. Because because the, it's, it's threatening when, when, when blacks, this is a period of time when black achievement, very much like now, on certain levels, is just incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, lynching is increasing, just like now. You know, violence is increasing. So these things are happening at the same time. And she realizes that both things are happening. A lot of people are saying, you know, oh, progress, it's inevitable. You know, we've come so far. That was, that was one. Then the other was saying, well, there's no progress. There's nothing. She was saying, well, you know, the two things are happening simultaneously. And that's how we have to strategize uh, our response to them. All right. So, Professor Giddings, you mentioned Booker T. Washington in, in our last segment, and I'm wondering if we could use that as a segue to talk about uh, the relationship that Wells had with other established black leadership of the day, particularly black male leadership of the, of the day, and somewhat, as you've already done, uh, if we could use that as a, a way to investigate the relationship black women leader, active, black women in leader, activist leadership today are finding themselves vis-a-vis -vis black men and the struggle, more broadly speaking. Could you give us maybe one or two examples from Wells' experience that might speak to what's happening today? Uh, 
I, I, Willis's anti-lynching campaign, Jared, begins um, in 1892. And uh, by 1895, for example, she has traveled to the British Isles. She's gone from New York uh, to California uh, with her campaign, and it's relatively successful. Uh, when Frederick Douglass dies in 1895, um, it is really Wells who should have had the mantle of uh, ra racial uh, leadership. Uh, no one had done what she had done uh, in this period. Not that there are other very courageous uh, people who had done things, but not on, on her level. Uh, and yet, uh, her gender, uh, among other things, but especially uh, her gender really kept her uh, from, uh, from her uh, getting the acknowledgement uh, from other uh, black, black, black leaders, even though there was just no question um, you know, it, one of the things, what, what happens in black nationalism, which we know, is that race um, is, is conflated with maleness, you know? Uh, so racial issues, it's about men uh, versus uh, women. We see that, we just see that happening uh, uh, still in our discourse. It's hard to disgorge that. And uh, she's a victim of that uh, as well. When she becomes a, a co-founder of the NAACP, um, she does. She becomes a co-founder after the fact, because even though she, um, she uh, was part of the founding part part of those founding um, uh, committee meetings, uh, she was excluded from being uh, called as one of the founding forty uh, in the beginning. In fact, whites had actually made her a part of the founding forty, but it was W. E. B. Du Bois who excluded her. Um, uh, so, uh, so, so, so she's going through that 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 issue. I mean, that's remarkable because, as I mentioned in in in, in the clip that that I'm quoting from, you have made the point in the past that. One of the things that's, that, that separated Wells from many of her contemporaries in terms of black leadership was her connection specifically to the black community and her feelings that, that, that the struggle itself needed to emanate almost exclusively from that community. And here it is that, uh, uh, that whites in the NAACP want to promote her leadership more than, than some of the leadership, including Du Bois, who, as you've pointed out, um, had their leadership and their prestige connected to their welcome, being welcomed by or, or, or desiring to be welcomed by the white community. Could you yes. <laughs> yes. say a word or two about I mean, this sounds wildly contradictory uh, <laughs> and yet perfectly consistent with this country's history of race and struggle. Indeed. And, and in addition to the gender issue, um, Wells, as you mentioned, Jared, is a firm believer uh, in the ideas that their leadership, black leadership, should not be anointed uh, by by those outside of the race. That it had to come from within uh, the race. It had to come uh, from the bottom up, uh, so to speak. She was, you know, an advocate. She 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 liked Marcus Garvey for that that same idea because this is how he rose uh, to leadership uh, versus some versus others. Not to say that they weren't they didn't have. They weren't great leaders in, in different ways, but versus others like Booker T. Washington and Du Bois, who are really anointed uh, more by the white establishment. Um, uh, so, uh, and and the reason why she thought about this, uh, 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 she also so she also had a class uh, analysis uh, also that went beyond the others because most of the leaders in this period of time, white and black believed that there should be a, an elite, a talented 10th, et cetera, who led uh, the race and who led uh, in the negotiations of race relations. Ida Wells says, said, no, this is not going to be effective. We need to do things. We need to mobilize grassroots, and, and we need to mobilize uh, across class in the black community. And so when she directed things like uh, 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 trolley car boycotts, uh, in uh, Memphis, uh, uh, Tennessee, um, that um, uh, uh, not only uh, used uh, utilized the black the the entire black community for that, but also had uh, economic implications. She saw uh, what that could do when she advocated that blacks, because of violence uh, in Memphis, actually go to Oklahoma and leave Memphis, these territories were opening up in this period, 
and something like 20% of the black community actually leaves Memphis, uh, leaving the, the city almost bankrupt. Uh, she understands that there's a that the grassroots movements are important, and it allowed her to use all kinds of and, and advocate all kinds of strategies. Certainly, bus boycotts and migration, but also, you know, one thing she learned in Oklahoma uh, was out there in the in the wild west of uh, Oklahoma in that period, that when black people were threatened with lynching. What, what would happen in Oklahoma was black men would uh, get their guns, their rifles, uh, band together and make sure it didn't happen. And I think it's out of that experience, you know, one of my favorite phrases is she said, she said a Winchester rifle should have a place of honor in every black home. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and if you could just very quickly tell us, you know, I mentioned that she was also Rosa Parks before Rosa Parks, that that uh, uh, this, this, this idea of not only uh, boycotting, but sitting down and refusing uh, second-class seating uh, is something that not only predates Rosa Parks in terms of buses, I know what had happened in, in, in I believe, Harlem in the 1920s, yes. but, but Ida B. Wells also does this on a train uh, uh, almost a century earlier. That's right. Uh, she, this is actually the beginning of her activist career. Uh, in 1883, uh, when uh, at this point uh, the trains there was first class tickets and second and smokers class, which they called, and one of the things that would rile the black community is that they would buy first class tickets, uh, uh, but but be forced to sit uh, in uh, a smoker's car, which at the point was just that point in particular was just filthy, and more than that, which subjected particularly women. Uh, to all kinds of crude behavior, it wasn't a safe space to be. Uh, and um, and this was one of the things, I think, just as it was true with Rosa Parks and what happened there, this was uh, one day, uh, th th this was thought out uh, ahead of time. And uh, one day, um, she sits in the first class car, um, uh, the conductor tells her to get up. She refuses to get up. Uh, and they finally have to extricate her, physically extricate her uh, out of the seat, but not before, which I had did great delight in retelling. She takes a big bite out of the conductor's hand, right. <laughs> you know, who, who, who later says in court, you know, I bled freely. You think she, she looks like a lady here, but, you know. Um, uh, but what she does, which is very important, is that she takes this and you can, you, can, you can imagine now, she's in her 20s. She takes uh, this, the Chesapeake and Ohio Railway to court over this. And in the lower courts actually wins the suit. Right. Uh, which is very, very important to the movement at that time. She will lose it uh, in the state Supreme Court. Uh, but uh, but this also makes her well known uh, in this in 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 in, the, in this era, uh, and um, uh, uh, and that's a case that's even cited uh, in the in, in uh, uh, Brown versus uh, in, in Plessy versus Ferguson uh, case, which is very important, of course. And uh, so so this is how this is how her career begins. And after the court case, she's asked to write articles. Uh, for newspapers, and this is how she also develops as a journalist. Well, Professor Giddings, thank you for joining us and helping us remember this very important woman and the very important traditions of struggle that she was emblematic of, uh, and uh, uh, for speaking, and that continues to speak to us today. I thank you very much for helping thank us. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for, for doing a, a segment on, on her. She's not talked about enough. A, a woman to that. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Take care, okay? You too. All right. Okay.